Hey, hey, welcome into the Big Ten Huddle. I'm your host, JR, and we are here to talk about all the things going on in the Big Ten. Guys, it's the football episode. We haven't had one of these in like two weeks, if you can tell by the grass behind me. I'm kind of happy to be talking about football because the Ohio State game is on right now. They're up by three with 30 seconds left, and I am stressed out. But I'm going to do my very best. <laughs> I have a reaction coming up. <laughs> I'm going to do my very best to pay attention to the football episode because I know we have football fans here as well, not just the basketball fans. Uh, Zach, how you doing tonight, man? Dude, happy to talk football with two guys I love talking ball with. Um, but I feel like the college football world keeps growing in terms of the fire it's on. It's kind of insane. It really is. It really is. And I know Justin is happy with the fire that's happening in Iowa right now with losing their five-star tackle. Justin, <laughs> how you doing with that? And also just generally, how you doing? Yeah, it's been a little bit of a uh, a week for Nebraska fans as a whole, myself included. Um, so yeah, it's nice to get a little bit of good news um, out of <laughs> Iowa since there was some bad news out of Nebraska. So but we're turning the page. I got my basketball jersey on because um, we're going to get our revenge. And uh, they lost – Iowa lost Caden Proctor, so all the trash they've been talking over the last few days. Ha, ha, ha. Well, I will <laughs> let you know. I know this is the football episode, but I'll let you know. My daughter filled out her bracket tonight. She's two and a half. And the way we do it is we show her logos of every team. And I showed her the farmer, which is Nebraska, because she yep. picked them to win in the first round. And I showed her – uh, the Cougars, which is Houston. And I said, who's going to win, the Farmers or the Cougars? And she picked the Farmers. That's so, right. Yeah. I, I'm, t I'm from Houston. So, like, Houston is, like, my secondary team. But I don't, like, I don't <laughs> wear the Houston stuff. Like, I'm a Nebraska fan through and through. But, like, Houston's usually my my go-to, like, right. when, when I don't have anybody else. And now they gotta, they're going to have to potentially play each other. So yeah, It's just a Nebraska fan's luck, huh? Yeah, unfortunately. But so, that's all right. Well, hey, uh, I, Zach, do you have any thoughts on the Caden Proctor before we get started? I, I didn't make it a huge topic, but I figure we'll at least address it. You have any thoughts on it? Listen, I'm just plugging for the slogan for our neck, our first ever t shirt the NCAA stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't even know the football portal was open. I didn't even think it's open right now. It's just it's like people are. I'm going to go in whenever I go in. It's okay. All right. it's Sorry, okay. I, I got it wrong. The NCAA stinks. Not it's stupid. It stinks. Well, both. Get rid of it. With yeah. with the Caden Proctor stuff, it was just so weird how it went down. He was committed, um, you know, to Iowa, went to Bama, recommitted to Iowa. And some people are indicating he might be going back to Bama. It's like, make up your mind. Well, just if he really hates iowa he really did the like the dirtiest thing ever which is yeah. get them an ncaa violation for tampering and then <laughs> I, saw, I saw the best tweet earlier was that he went he went and basically got an apartment in iowa for uh college basketball season and then left wow which which checks out he wanted to go yeah. watch Caitlin clark i guess yeah i guess so he just wanted oh, to check man. it out Oh, man. All right. Well, let's get into the first topic here, guys. Uh, and I don't know how long we'll spend on this one, but Clemson sues the ACC, the grant of rights with them. What does uh, Clemson suing the ACC mean for the Big Ten? My real short answer is that, you know, if we thought that it was an if the ACC is gone at some point, I mean, this is no longer an if. This is a win. Uh, I, I think this could possibly impact the timing of when the ACC is gone. But for the most part, I feel like Clemson is a – is an SEC school all the way. I don't really see any reason why they would come to the Big Ten. Or, I mean, I guess I can see the, why the Big Ten would want them. But just culture and fit and everything like that, they seem to fit much more into the SEC. So I, I can't really see this meaning that the Big Ten has another option to look at. But, uh, but Zach, I'm curious your thoughts on the Clemson uh, suing the ACC grant of rights. Well, I think what's interesting to note was the ACC's response, which is it was the, I think it was the same response that they gave to Florida State, which is we will exact our what we've agreed to if you leave the conference. So I don't think I like I don't think the end is in 2024 or even 2025. 
but I think it means the end is near for the ACC and not that hasn't changed. I think we've, I think we're all on record uh, on our various shows, you know, stating that the ACC's days are numbered, but I think this makes it much more of a reality because your, your two biggest programs, both in terms right now of football pedigree and in terms of marketability is Florida state and Clemson. Right. Miami traditionally has been a power, but their 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 cachet is not nearly as high as either of those schools at this present moment. So you have the two big dogs in the ACC suing the ACC over their grant of rights. It, it It's inevitable. And I, I think that's it's very similar, I think, in regards to Oklahoma and Texas leaving the Big 12, except they could just leave, whereas the ACC, they have something in place that that's going to take a while and drag this out. Yeah, I was listening to some Clemson uh, guys over at Clemson Live. Go check them out. That's a good podcast that I heard. Well, it's, I think it's mainly just a YouTube channel. I don't know if they do any podcasting, but uh, they were talking about how they just they they are just completely done with the ACC. There is nothing about the ACC that's keeping them there. There's nothing about the ACC that makes them want to stay a part of it and their idea is like the ACC is going to try to drag this out in court but um you know their biggest problem is with ESPN because they feel like ESPN does not prioritize the ACC network nearly as much as they do the SEC network you know mm-hmm. and part of that stems back to Florida State and how uh, ESPN wanted content for their SEC network but not their ACC network which you know that's a whole I know Mark Rogers has some thoughts on that I don't know if you've talked to him about that Justin but um, just overall like the ACC does not feel like ESPN is giving them a fair shake and uh, it's a it's an issue for sure but what are your thoughts Justin yeah I I definitely see this as a a yeah, this the writing on the wall has been there, I think, for Clemson. And I agree with you. I do think they would be an SEC school. I think it's one of those things where if, if there was any more uh, a movement in regards to a couple of these schools that we're asking questions about in terms of, you know, these revenue distributions, it would probably be Clemson to the SEC. And, you know, if Notre Dame joins a conference or a, like moves conferences, like they would be a Big Ten style school, in my opinion. I don't know how all this is going to play out, but I definitely do know that probably Clemson's out. And then it's all going to be this slow process towards the big power two conferences. It's, yep. it's going to be, you know, now it's Clemson, you know, and next it's going to be a different team and it's, it's all just a s- slow snowball. Well, now it's kind of a quick snowball towards that. So this is just another step in that, in that process. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, I guess just really fast, Zach, do you feel like they're like if you had to give a percentage chance of Clemson to the Big Ten, what what's your I mean, obviously, the other percentage would be the the uh, SEC because the ACC is not sticking around. But like, what's your percentage chance of Clemson to the Big Ten? So I'll answer it by I'll say two things here. I would say like five percent because I agree. I think Clemson culturally fits more in the SEC but I think it gives a hundred percent chance of Notre Dame not joining the ACC and joining the big 10. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, that yeah. was where I, yeah, that was, that was where I was thinking with that is, is I think that definitely increases Notre Dame's likelihood of, of then coming to the big 10. I think that would be the next potential move off of this. Yeah. All right. Good stuff there. I uh, brought up the chat earlier, but Jackson is here. Jackson. Thank you. Uh, he said, what's up big 10 nation. We appreciate you being here uh, and checking out our show and also sunny he says let clemson go to the sec bring fsu notre dame to the big uh, as in the big 10 i don't yes. know if i'm uh, florida state i don't know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey whatever whatever brings the money up that's what i'm that's for, true you know? i mean they bring revenue so let's go yeah. that means more money for our schools there we go so all right guys let's talk 14 team playoffs so essentially what's going on here is uh i mean this was decided like last week we just missed it because we didn't have a show last week but the big 10 and the sec are getting the same amount of pay cut percentage based on uh what was it 29 percent, something like that um i should have pulled that up um but yeah, something like that. So about 29% of the revenue, the ACC is getting about 18%, and then the Big 12 about 12%, and then the group of five school getting about 
percent of that. So this is a uh, kind of an interesting situation, especially figuring out, you know, what's fair, what's not fair. Uh, Justin, we'll go to you first on this. I mean, overall, do you feel like the, the distribution of the money for the conferences with the big 10, the sec getting the same, the ACC getting a little bit more than the big 12. And then obviously the group of five getting the least amount. Do you feel like that is fair? Yeah, I do because you know, looking at at last year's numbers, you know, there was a combined three point three billion between all of them. Um, Eight hundred and fifty three million went to the SEC in twenty twenty three. It was a, a fifty mil increase over twenty twenty two, and so each school getting distributed out fifty one point three million uh, to each fourteen, and they netted, you know, they 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 attributed the increase to postseason events, bowl games, investment incomes, and netted about one hundred ninety one mil. And then looking at the Big Ten at 846 million, you know, right there, the same 853, 846, ne negligible. Each team getting 58.8 million. Of course, Nebraska, Maryland, Ruggers are still getting partial shares right now. And then next was the a ACC at 617 million. And they had to distribute a little less to each school. So, in terms of looking at that, you know, they distributed out 37.9 to 41.3 million per school and the Big 12, 42 to 44 million. Um, but just based on, you know, what we're looking at there, it, it's 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 evened out proportionally. Um, I think the one thing that we, you know, we got to take into account is uh, or one thing that's kind of ironic to me is, you know, we created this 12, well, now 14 team playoff. It's going to continue to change. But um, this 14 team playoff, because we wanted the group of five schools, you know, and those schools to be able to have a fighting chance in the playoff. And now the group of five schools are what getting like two mil. I don't even know what they're going to be getting each, but five, like you said, five, 6%, something like that. And um, this is just going to continue the separation of, of the talent between them and the other schools. And so on one hand, we opened up the the playoff for the group of five teams, but on the other hand, we handicapped them in a way. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not having the revenue, the schools with the more revenue are going to do the best. It's no secret. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I just want to reference these numbers really fast. I uh, got them exact. The ACC gets 17.1%. The Big 12 receives 147 And then roughly 10% will be distributed to Notre Dame and the 64 group of five teams. So Notre Dame gets the same amount of money as the 64. 64. That's the number of teams in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> well, I guess 68 now. 64 group of five teams. Like, that's just... Absolutely I got, wild. I thought they got 13 mil. Who did? Uh, I thought Notre Dame got 13 mil. I was I guess I was wrong. They were including uh, that 10%. That's tough. That's that's real tough. Oh no, they 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 each, sorry, they each get Notre Dame. Or maybe it's not. I'll have to read it more. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't remember. I think they get 13 mil, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not 100 percent okay. sure. Don't don't, don't yeah, we'll go with that. that. I'll try to I'll try to look something up for sure yeah. just to be Accord just to be sure. But Zach, your thoughts? Well, I was going to say according to SI.com, it's twenty one. The Big Ten and SEC schools will make more than twenty one million per year. Uh, schools from the ACC and Big Twelve will receive more than thirteen and twelve. And I believe because of the association of the ACC, that's where Notre Dame lands. Okay. Um, so that's that is with the the new, I think the new proposed 14 team mm. playoff, um, which, you know, just a real quick aside, another incentive for Notre Dame to join the big 10. Yeah. Um, I, I think I am very torn. One, one thing I'm very grateful for is that it doesn't seem like they're going to adopt the three, three, two, two, one model, yeah. which is like the automatic bids. Cause that, I was very grateful that they included automatic bids with the expansion to 12, but like, I want automatic bids to be earned with the championship. Yeah. Like, I think that needs to be in the thing. And so I'm grateful that they, they did that, but Justin, you make a really good point. This, and we already knew it was kind of going towards the big two, mm -hmm. but I think this feels like a band aid that we are just very slowly stripping away and what we're going to have between now and when we get to the big two is a lot of teams getting left in the dust. Yeah. So I, I don't understand why we don't just 
it would be painful, but just blow the whole thing up and just do it. But they're, they're not going to. Um, but I, I think it's, it's going to be a rough couple years, I think for teams that are quite honestly have been maybe in the mix in the top 15, top 20, but don't have the revenue and opportunity for, for revenue like the teams in the power conferences. And that includes now teams in the big 12 and most of the teams in the ACC, uh, because aside from Florida state and, uh, Clemson, you like, they're not going to have the same type of support. Now, maybe, maybe a school can get their NIL going and, and get more revenue, but I think it really, it really handicaps schools that don't have the alumni support, have the financial backing and the, the TV revenue that they could have gotten, it's, it's, there's nothing there now, or there's not nearly as much as, I mean, Rutgers or, or Maryland or Nebraska. Uh, well, I, and, and I think that really, really bodes well for those teams in the big 10 and the sec, but like, think of a team like Utah, who we just talked about on this show about three weeks ago, like Utah isn't going to have the, the same financial backing. Now, granted, I think their NIL could be really good, but it, it just, it's going to handicap those schools. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, Justin, we have Mike here. He says, hey, guys, That's Justin. Mike. He says, go Big Red. Yes, hey, I'll sir. give you, I'll give you a go Big Red too, Mike. All I right. I'm, I'm a Buckeye fan, but I uh, I appreciate Nebraska. And then he also brings up what we talked about. Iowa lost pre and Proctor back to Alabama for real yep. money, money. Yes. Yep. Uh, appreciate you joining us, Mike. Go Big Red. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the other part of this too, guys, right, is that ESPN inks the deal for the college football playoffs to stick with them through 2031 to 2032. I remember that one. Uh, <laughs> but they they stick with them until that time. I mean, Zach, you said it yourself. Like, we're just inching close and closer to this Big Ten SEC, uh, you know, kind of combo. What's going to basically be like the AFC, NFC college football playoffs. Uh, we're just going to get there eventually. Why don't we do it? I mean, to me, I feel like that's only like two years away, but with this ESPN deal, do you guys feel like the ESPN, you know, financial deal makes this a little bit stronger to the point where it's going to be 14 teams or more and include all of these teams? Um, I didn't write that down, but I just thought about that. So I'm, I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are on if this ESPN contract will delay it, or do you think, you know, ESPN kind of works with it. And as long as they're involved in whatever the SEC and the big 10 does like that stays, uh, obviously if the ACC just explodes and goes away, like that's going to ruin things a little bit, but Justin, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, with the ESPN TV deal with the college football playoff, when that was reported, they still had not finalized that. And, and that was the thing that people were missing. That was not finalized. And one of the reasons why they had the urgency and they got the, the people together to come up with the 12 and finalize the 12-team playoff model was because ESPN was wanting to know what this was going to look like. And, and it gave other you know networks the potential opportunity to enter the bidding, but ESPN really wanted to know <clears throat> how this was going to be executed and stuff like that. So... I I don't necessarily know if they're going to do something that would compromise the deal with ESPN. So I'd have to imagine because what they signed that four days ago, um, the new agreement. The ESPN so, one. Yeah, I think that was four yeah, days yeah. ago they signed the new agreement, and so I think ESPN is probably looped into these changes. And uh, yeah, so uh, I I think there's there's a lot of uh, cohesion there with with. Um, the ESPN in this college football playoff and, and, you know, the ESPN has their best, you know, they have their sec teams best interests at heart when they take this. So they're not going to let that TV deal go for sure. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Zach, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, I think my, my, I don't like it because I would love ESPN to not have control of the playoff, but I think the reality is they are going to, they're going to be able to influence the sport and they will do whatever is going to make them the most money. Yep. So, and I don't, I don't necessarily blame them for that, but I, I mean, it's why they have a lot of the sec 
why they're more tied into the SEC is because it does sell. Um, like a, a number of those teams are much more nationally are, na- are more national brands. And so I just, I think as long as ESPN is involved, I, I think if the SEC Big Ten, Big Two becomes the more lucrative option, that's when it will start progressing more for yep. them. But until then, I mean, let's let's be honest. How much, how many eyeballs are being directed to ESPN because of all this conference realignment? Like, so they're yep. going to let this bleed out a bit. I think. Mm-hmm. I see it slightly different of um, that because one of the things that the SEC you know, they're right there with Nebraska, or, um, Nebraska, the Big Ten in terms of, sorry, I've been talking about Nebraska all day, the Big Ten in terms of of their revenue. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where I think, you know, with the, the TV deals that are in place for the Big Ten, I 100% think that the Big Ten and, and some of the big, the brands the Big Ten's adding, that the Big Ten will be a more lucrative uh, place to be than the SEC, because I think that, the way the Big Ten operates is more as a business than the than the SEC has in the past. I think that the way the Big Ten carries themselves, it's about, you know, they like teams with structure. They like teams with, you know, good leadership. They like teams with good academic standings, football. And I think over time, I think that's going to get the Big Ten more money. I think the SEC, and they even said this when they talked about their revenue increase last year, there was generated you know that there was more um, attention generated in year over year than there usually is towards the SEC this past season, and some of it probably has to do with what you're talking about. Um, but I think the Big Ten has just as big of brands, and I do think that you know you got Alabama. We don't know what's going to happen with Alabama and, and stuff like that. But then you yeah. you know you turn that over, and so you have a couple schools there, and and a, and a few schools that also I believe were very so so much reliant on NIL. I don't know if they're going to be able to even have retention of their players with the way this works and money, you know, come for more money and stuff like that. So I think the Big Ten has positioned themselves in a much better spot. And I do do have more visibility being with CBS, Fox, and uh, NBC because they're going to have Fox Big Noon kickoff. They're going to have that, that you know, 2 p.m. SEC game, and then they're going to have the N- NBC primetime game. So there's going to be a lot of visibility there too. So, Oh, yeah. But I, I was – I, I should have clarified. I meant between the ACC and the SEC. Not oh, the oh, gotcha. Okay. But, yeah. but everything you said, Justin, could yeah. I could not have said it better myself. That's, yeah. that's all stated. Because the ACC did have 617 mil, so it wasn't chump change last year. No, not at all. Good points. Good points. Uh, before we move on, Dick is here with us. As boiler up, Dick. Uh, we are we are thankful you're here with us, even on our football episode. Yes, yes boiler sir. up, indeed. Uh, with uh, with football. Hey, we're going to be talking some Hudson Card later, so stick around if you want to hear it's about the true. projected QB battles. I don't think that one's a very tough one to project. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, uh, Justin, this one is all about you, man. Uh, Trev Alberts to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Texas A&M from Nebraska. I feel like I can intro this one, but um, obviously you're going to be able to talk about this much better. So uh, you want to just kind of give us a little bit of uh, oversight, what's going on here, and then kind of share your thoughts on the entire situation? Yeah, so essentially what happened is uh, Trev Alberts um, decided up in the night one night to uh, – again. oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> they put a USC guy up there. I don't know why. <laughs> And but, uh, Justin decided to up in the night, just leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good, like, the irony that, of that funny. Right there. See ya. I'm, I'm out, guys. Um, That's funny. No, but, uh, you know, literally left in the night. And um, in the next morning, you know, Husker fans were shocked. Everybody was just kind of trying to figure out what's going on. But, you know, earlier in the day, it was reported that, you know, they were finalizing a deal. But then there was a big gap. And then it was there was reports out of Nebraska that, there were things turning behind the scenes and that potentially this was Trev Albert's way of getting leverage on, you know, the board of regents um, because of a disagreement that they may have been having um, within, you know, certain parts of the department and certain decisions. So ultimately 
you know, he, I don't think the board of regents blinked and he decided to leave. People were talking about it, it was money. You know, they're making him a top two paid SEC athletic director, top 10 in the country. He already was that. He was already a top 10 paid athletic director in the country. Got an $800,000 raise eight months ago to $1.7 million. He was second in the Big Ten in terms of athletic director pay. It was not money. It was something to do with in the board of regents that has been, you know, all but confirmed essentially my take on it was this. Um, I don't agree with the way he did it. I have not said anything bad about him on Twitter or anything like that. And the Nebraska fan base was very much weaponized against him. And I get it, right? I get it because of the way he went about it was completely wrong. There was no transparency, none of that. And he should have exposed specifically who the issue was, what the issue was on his way out the door so we can fix it. The only thing that I disagreed with um, with the fan base's reaction is the fact that the fan base was rightfully upset, but all of the attention was to criticize Trev. And I'm like, okay, I get it, but let's use this energy. He's gone. We can hate him forever. Let's use this energy to go after the Board of Regents because there's a reason our president left and we have an interim president still. There's a reason Trev Alberts left and we have an interim athletic director something isn't right and there's some kind of miscommunication in there and the fan base's attention needs to be take this opportunity while we have everybody's attention and emotion let's weaponize it towards fixing the issue so that way when we get a new athletic director a new president it's the right people in place and they're going to be here trev alberts has his name inside the stadium and left mm -hmm. left us overnight without you know any indication and and then closed it out with an email that was posted to Twitter. That was his farewell, you know, and then the tone deaf tweets about Nebraska playing Texas A&M and, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways he could have went about it, but I, and, and fans were coming after me for this, but I'm like, listen, I'm not, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Let's just attack who we need to attack to, for the betterment of the athletic department. Criticizing Trev does not help Nebraska. We need to do what we need to do to help Nebraska. And that's my take on it. Yeah, we have Mike here. He says, uh, Trev, uh, did Nebraska wrong? This, this will make us stronger, he hopes. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I when I look at it, like, I obviously I don't understand all of it to the extent that you do, Justin. That, that yeah. was good information. I appreciate you sharing that. But yeah. on the other level, like, anytime I see somebody as beloved, uh, former player, you know, like Trev Alberts to mm -hmm. leave – their alma mater leave where they gain so much of their you know their fame and notoriety and mm -hmm. things like that and obviously he could have he could have i'm not giving only nebraska that credit like he could have gained that somewhere else too i'm sure but still like nebraska gave that to him yep. through his stardom at nebraska and then you know having his nfl career as well and those things but um just to to leave like that we're going to talk about another guy who left here in a minute but um i just it it, it it pains the fans and that's the, those are the ones that really lose yeah. out, you know, yeah. because, you know, the, the regents might have, you know, or the regents did do him dirty. And obviously there's issues there. Uh, like you said, it's not just Trev Alberts, but the president as well. Um, but you're exactly right. If there is an issue with the regents, that's what has to be addressed more than anything else, because you don't just lose alumni players with names in the stadium overnight yeah. because they make more money somewhere else. Uh, yeah. That's not. It doesn't happen like that. Zach, your thoughts? Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I appreciate what you were uh, like, everything you were saying, Justin, I, I think the articles I've read and I'm, I'm not nearly as LinkedIn as you are, mm -hmm. but sports business journal, it, it mentioned that he, that Trev Alberts had recently expressed frustration that regions had not hired a president to replace Ted Carter. Yep. And Ted Carter was named Ohio state's president's last August. Yep. Eight so months, like, I think. yeah. So like, and even it seemed like the uh, governor, Jim Pillen, yeah. uh, said that Albert's decision like it was disappointing, but that he implored the university's board of regents Thursday to act quickly. Yeah. So I, I think it's just really helpful because I think while there's some irony that Albert said leadership is critical and this is how he left, mm -hmm. there's also a reality that, you know, the the leadership up top was, it, it seems yeah. like there is an issue there. And like, as someone, you know, we all have probably worked for different organizations and st stuff. 
if the leadership above you is not doing their jobs, it makes it really hard for you to, to do your job. And if you don't even know who your manager is, like, let's say, you know, you want to know who your manager is going to be at the end of the day for, for your career. Cause that's what you, that's your developer. That's who you, that's lead by example guy, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, just to add a little extra to this too, um, you know, wh when it happened, you know, he did mention that in, a, in an interview about that. And so when it actually happened, we went immediately live on the voice of college football channel and I was immediately telling people like, this is a board of regents issue. This isn't a money issue. And it was, it was, should have been obvious to everybody. Um, but I don't think this, it, the thing is Trev left the athletic department way better than he found it. Right. So we do have to acknowledge that what he did was good here. And, but at the same time we can hate him, but acknowledge what he did was good. The athletic department is still going the right direction. No coaches have left. Matt rules committed. The governor reached out to Matt Rule directly, you know, to to talk to him about it. Nebraska's still going the right direction, and and I don't think this is going to stop a thing. You know, um, the the interim athletic director has been at Nebraska since 1983, so you know they're in good hands right now. So um, yeah, I don't think it'll impact us too negatively. To answer that question. I was I was going to read the quote from Matt Rule really fast. It says, I'm here and I'm all in. And Julie's all in, referring to his wife. I loved, I loved Ted Carter and I loved Trev. And I, and I came close. Sorry. And I came because of them. But I came to be at the University of Nebraska. And I've loved the people I've met. And we're not going anywhere unless you guys kick me out. So yep. obviously, his wife, you know. his wife has a business there. And his, yeah. his son's enrolled in school. They're, they're building there. And they are there. He said that from the start, and that's why even on that live stream, I was like, no matter what, Matt Rule's not going. Anywhere. He's right. said it in so many interviews that the reason he's there is because of the people, the way it operates, the ethos of Nebraska, and he hasn't deviated from that. I don't know why anybody thought he was going to leave, but people reached out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, overall, like you look at Nebraska losing – an AD to the SEC. And that's obviously not something, you know, if these two conferences are equal, that's not something you want to see happen. So Zach, in your opinion, like for overall, for the big 10, obviously we talked about Nebraska, you know, we think everything's okay there, but like at the end of the day, like, do you think this is an issue Zach for the big 10 to be losing an athletic director from one of its biggest universities to one of the biggest universities in Texas a or in, in Texas A&M? in the sec or are you just kind of like this this is a isolated incident it's it's not it's not something to be concerned about well i i was gonna say there's an irony that texas a&m is replacing an ad that went to a big 10 school so true I, so and, and granted it you know i think ohio state right now might be a, a top three athletic department in the country so but i think to that point i think I think what it does is expose it exposes bigger problems, but I don't think it's an issue for the Big Ten. And I think if if it fixes the problems up top for Nebraska, honestly, it it actually could end up being the best thing that could happen, because just you know, there's the emotional, there's the emotional whiplash, which I think Jr. You've mentioned, and I think Justin, you've been talking about. Like, if it sucks for the fans because you know it's storied, but Remember, storied sons, like that. That's not always the fix. Now, yeah. Trev did a lot to make Scott things better. Frost. <laughs> right, I was right. Of Scott Frost. I, I don't know how many episodes I did on Big Ten football talk about how he should be fired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of episodes about how he should be fired. Um, <laughs> it, uh, but just because of the just because there's emotional whiplash does not mean that this is going to be a long-term blow. Right. So we don't know, like they could really botch the hire, but honestly, I think if Matt rule truly is there to stay, like he is the one, unless if an athletic director just blocks him from what he wants to do. Yeah. Like right. he is the guy that's going to build the foundation, particularly as a football school. Yeah. And if he's all in, 
I still like where Nebraska's going. You yeah. know, I I, I think uh, Dick Stillwagon was was talking about the three three four five Dick, win. Dick Stillwagon doesn't understand what saying an athletic department is moving in the right direction means. He apparently thinks athletic department means football. So Dick's Dick's uh, opinion is about as um, you know fitting as his name. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All that to say, like, I think we're seeing both as a football program and as, as, as a conference, like, I, I think Nebraska's future is still bright. I just emotionally, I think emotionally it's pretty, it's pretty uh, rough, but I, I, I'm not too concerned about the overall trajectory. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, hey, guys, we are going to uh, take a break really fast. We're going to watch a commercial, and then we'll come back, and we will do some Tony Alford talk. So here is a commercial really fast. You can rep your alma mater or your favorite team in style. Look no further than Home Field. Home Field, based in Indianapolis, is your go-to destination for premium collegiate apparel. With a passion for comfort and a flair for vintage design, Home Field brings you officially licensed gear that is cozy as it is stylish. With over 150 colleges to choose, from home field digs deep into the archives uncovering forgotten logos iconic mascots and legendary moments to create apparel that is truly one of a kind head on over to homefieldapparel.com use my code tbth for 15 percent off for news new customers or use my link in the description if you're a serious call all right, CB to a- analytics doesn't pay for the football episodes, so we're not going to give them the football episodes. Oh, Husker jacket, I like Dick. Don't take All it. Right. I'm just, I'm just messing with you, buddy. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Dick. And during basketball season, the uh, the football episodes are not nearly as popular, but people do watch them after. But we do yeah. appreciate you being here, Dick. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Can Can yeah. I just point out that it, it's uh, it's our home field, right? They're the or who's the company? Home field. Yes. Do they have an NCAA stink shirt yet? No. Ah, it's that idea to them. Yeah. Throw yeah. That out there. Yeah. We'll throw that one at them and see what they do. That Husker it. jacket, though. I saw a Husker jacket. I like, but yeah, yeah, right. I put those in there. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so Tony Alford. Uh, there we go, Dick. I appreciate you all too. I have no feeling. <laughs> love it. Love it. Nick, just remember, I picked your team to win it all, man. I picked your team to win it all. So I'm high on. Like I should have some. I should. I should have some. Uh, some. Some uh, notoriety with Purdue fans now. John Diadamo in here just in time. <laughs> Hello, John. Good to have you here. We're just going to talk some Michigan football here and some Ohio State football. So the best topic. <laughs> yep. Yes. Oh, I got here just in time for Tony Alford. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Tony Alford, I'll let you guys share your opinions here in just a second. I'm just going to give mine really fast, which is so and if nobody knows what's going on, which I assume most people do. But at the end of the day, Tony Alford was a running back coach for Ohio State in the middle of the night, kind of like Trev Alberts. He, uh, <laughs> he left at like 930 one morning and apparently all of Ohio State was scrambling because they didn't know that this was happening. Um You know, I don't know how much it caught him off guard, but Ryan Day said in a press conference today that it pretty much caught him all off guard, and they they weren't expecting him to just up and leave in the middle of of spring ball. So uh, obviously he uh, was able to leave without many people knowing, and um, I don't know if that was his plan or what that gets him. I know that there were some Michigan uh, reporters saying that, you know, he took some playbook stuff and recruiting stuff with him, you know, if, if he did. Great. You know, yeah. I, I we're like a week into spring ball, so I don't know if how much of a playbook you're actually going to have. But, you know, if it helps, it helps. Sure. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I feel like both parties kind of won out here. And I know that Michigan fans are going to be in the chat like, oh, Ohio State fan thinking, thinking you're still great. And that's fine. If you know me, I'm I'm pretty impartial. I, I'm not super biased. I'm, you know, I am a fan, so I do have some bias, but at the end of the day, like, I feel like Ohio state feels like they have a very, very good running back room. That's going to attract a good running back coach. The rumor right now is DeMarco Murray from Oklahoma is coming over or Robert Gillespie from Alabama is coming over. Those are apparently the two big candidates right now, but, uh, but Tony Alford is a really good recruiter. And, uh, you know, there have been some Ohio state fans that have tried to tried to downgrade his recruiting a little bit lately. And I get that at the end of the day, he's brought in, you know, highly rated backs, uh, not 
not in 2023, but he's also lost some recently. So, but you're going to get that in college football. So I feel like personally, both parties kind of won out here. Michigan got to improve their recruiting in some ways. They got to uh, move on from Mike Hart and Ohio State. You know, I know not every Michigan fan will believe me. That's fine. But, you know, reports are, whether you believe them or not, that uh, Tony Alford kind of had the heat on him put in January. And that mm-hmm. was you know, he didn't get his extension. He, he didn't get a raise. And so that's kind of what made him upset and why he left. And, um, you know, it is what it is. It's football. It's big business. It's not always going to make everybody happy. And I think if you're just trying to make people happy, you're probably, uh, you're probably doing it wrong. So, uh, Zach, I know that you've paid close attention to the situation as well. Uh, why do you think Tony Alford left for Michigan and just overall your kind of your take on it? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you, you hit it the nail on the head that I I think there was a bit of, I I don't want to say bitterness, but maybe a sour taste because Tony Alford did not get an extension. And, you know, I think uh, Jeremy Birmingham, who is one of the beat writers in Columbus, even hinted at the fact that Ryan Day may have said, Hey, you should go to this, this uh, coaching clinic to, to look at other jobs. Like now, I don't know how, accurate that is that's just something that was reported by a well-respected beat writer uh on the columbus beat um that being said like i I don't think any ohio state fan at least any reasonable ohio state fan would say that tony alford's a scrub like he's a great position coach yeah if they're doing that they're just coping i mean right right he's a good coach. like he's a good coach he's been a very good recruiter like we're when we talk about misses, we're talking about oh he missed on Bijan Robinson, right? Oh we missed like he missed on like the best running back in the world ever. Like so, like I he missed on a couple of elite guys because there's other elite schools for running backs. Yeah. Like in other news, water is wet. Um, that being said, I. Like Tony Alford is a really good position coach. And I do think he's as good as Mike Hart was. I think he is a a little bit of an upgrade. I think he's an upgrade as a recruiter. Again, like Michigan has been really good at developing, but like, if you look at the recruiting rankings for their backs, aside from Donovan Edwards, like they haven't been super, super high recruits, but they've developed into dudes, right? Like Blake Corum was a dude this year. Yeah. Uh, he's been a dude the past Shoot. couple. Of yeah, years. he's been a dude. Yeah. 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 Sorry that I misspoke there. Yeah. Um. So like, almost won I, the Heisman two years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He. Sh- yeah. Probably should have. He got hurt. Um, because the only reason he damn near didn't. Yeah. So all, all that being said, it, I do think it could be a win-win because I do think Ohio State could go out and and hire someone who me- meshes better with Chip Kelly, uh, someone who is maybe fresh blood into that program. Um, I, yeah, so I, I don't think it's – I think, again, the shock, I think similar to tra- – it's certainly not the same scale because athletic director, favored son versus Tony Alford, who was – you know, he was, he was a position coach. Just so a like, shock. Yeah. It's, so it, yeah, it's just a rival. Yeah, the rivalry shock. That's a good way to put it, Justin. Yeah. And, um, oh, go ahead. Some questions here. I just want to address these really fast. Uh, John says, "Here's what I'm wondering: If OSU was over Alford, why didn't they have a replacement ready? Not extending him forced his hand to play the market. Very true. I don't yeah. know why they didn't have somebody ready. Uh, and I'm not saying that every report that I've read is 100, you know, uh, the right thing. That's just what I've read." If, uh, if I'm being honest, I heard rumblings of Ryan Day not being happy with Tony Alford, but I never heard that he was going to fire him. The only thing I ever heard was that like Bill O'Brien would have free reign to bring in a running back coach if he wanted to. Uh, but we also heard that about offensive line, tight end, uh, you know, all, all of those except wide receiver where Brian Hartline was. So at the end of the day, like, <clears throat> you know, was it something they were expecting? I don't know uh, yeah. if they were like, expecting him to leave but i i do know i don't think they were expecting him to leave in the spring so maybe they thought at the end of next year um and he says even i had a buckeye caller on my show saying they did uh what did you expect the guy to do uh yeah I, don't get me wrong i uh when you get not extended you only have one year left on your deal you get your salary cut you go and you look somewhere else and yeah, i yeah. think zach's right i think it was more the shock 
that he went up north like he did rather than he left. And there does probably need to be a conversation there with now Ryan Day is coaching the running backs all through spring, you know, instead of having somebody on his list ready to hire. Of course, yeah. they could hire somebody tomorrow and I could be eating my words, which is fine. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, like, you know, it is what it is. I'm not trying to say, you know, something some of those Buckeye fans have been saying, that like, oh, he was on his way out. Nobody wanted him here. That's not. That's not. You mind, do you mind if but I get I do my think th- the pressure oh. was on a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Do you mind if I get my thoughts on that? Um, because, like, to your point, right, I, I do I, I do agree with a lot of what all of y'all are saying. Um, I, I think the truth is always somewhere in the middle of all these reports and stuff like that. So my take on it is I think Ryan day should have been a little bit more proactive in his decision-making. If he didn't want him there, he shouldn't have pulled, you know, if that, if he truly didn't want him there, my other thinking is that the contract thing is really just to let him know that like this year it's performance based. And that is, that is, he was the only guy who didn't get an extension and an increase. And so, That was his sign right there that like, okay, this is, it's a wake up call to him that this year is based on performance and you need to perform this year or you're out. And it's partially too, because Ryan Day is on the hot seat as well. If he doesn't, you know, with this team perform the way he should. Now looking at it from Tony Alford's side, you know, he is going to a place where he can get more opportunities to grow within the staff at, at that university. You know, he can, get promoted much easier at Michigan um, with the current state of the staff than he can over at Ohio State. Another thing, too, that I think in retrospect this works out for is Chip Kelly, um, and that's the reason I think it might benefit Ohio State, not any other reason. Had Chip Kelly not have been the OC there, I wouldn't have thought, like, you know, it it had changed with O'Brien. I I would have thought the, you know, Alfred was better to be in there with O'Brien. But now Chip Kelly's coming in, and he's talking about he wants the offense to be, he's saying he wants it to be a collaborative effort. He said, it's not my offense, it's Ohio State's offense. Mm -hmm. And this gives him the opportunity to get in there and give a, get a running back coach that fits his offense a little bit more. So maybe, you know, in the collaboration that he did, because he said he did, uh, he collaborated with, you know, basically everybody in the staff, Hartline, Alfred, uh, Keenan Bailey, and constructing the offense. So now he has an opportunity to get somebody who fits a little bit more of his ideals and his structures and the way he wants to run his offense. And that may help him in regards to that. And then similar to Zach's point, you know, the recruiting over at Michigan and, and more opportunity for him. I think this made sense. And I think it made sense for both sides. But I think it made sense for both sides in the terms of, what it does for Chip Kelly's ability to potentially go, you know, have his input in a uh, running back coach that is going to fit his style and what he wants to do there. So he's not going to have to adapt and change too much. Yeah, you just would wish it wouldn't happen in the middle of spring ball. You know, you you wish that this would have been resolved in January. And I tweeted that out. I said, like, you know, obviously I'm not blaming Ryan Day a ton for this, but like at a certain point, like to me as an Ohio State fan, I feel like Ryan Day needs to learn to be a little bit more cutthroat. You know, yeah, he's a very right. nice guy. He's very much into, you know, helping people with their mental health and all that stuff. Like, I, I think that's great. I love that my coach is, you know, has good character. However, at the You're end the of the day, seat. like, do what? You're on the hot seat at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you lose, and, and you lose out in situations because sometimes you are too nice. If yep. Ryan Day wanted Tony Alford gone, he should have been the one to send him packing. And he should have been the one with somebody ready to hire just in case something happened. Uh, this is twice now in the off season where coaches have left, you know, Bill O'Brien, which we got Chip Kelly right away after that. So, you know, it's not that big of yeah. a deal, but um, you know, if you want a coach gone, you need to be the proactive one in getting rid of them. Yeah. And I know that everybody's concerned about, you know, dad on his you know on the bread line and not you know having a job but let's not act like these guys are making eighty thousand dollars a year or you know forty thousand yeah. dollars a year these guys are making good money they'll be fine for a little while uh not not having everything so yeah. um at the end of the day yes ohio state will be fine but i still think that ryan day you know he he has to take some responsibility here and learn from this as well as he's been learning from other things this is what you get when you hire a first-time head coach because yep. I like how people can can admit that he was forced, his hand was forced, but still get mad at him for leaving. 
and not criticize Ryan Day for not being cutthroat. Like he should have made his intents yeah. known, and it shouldn't have been a contract thing. He should have talked to him right there, set expectations, and that should have been the end of it. Whether he goes, continues, or whether he's fired, but yeah, decision yeah. should have been made then. That's, that's a good, good take. Well, I was just gonna say, I think. And I think where Ryan Day is going to feel it the most is the psychological advantage continues to be with Michigan. Right? If you remember in 2019, Greg Madison, Al Washington, they came over from Michigan to Ohio State, and it kind of felt like Ryan Day was the cutthroat one. He's like, I'm yeah. taking your coaches. And like, you know, Al Washington wasn't the greatest coach, and Greg Madison was in the twilight of his career but it still felt like it was a psychological dagger saying, I own you. Well, that now Michigan can do the same thing, regardless of what Ohio state fans think. And as much as they try to disown Tony Alford, like they still have the psychological edge. This is a win for them. Yep. And I, I think it really goes to that point. Ryan day has struggled to be cutthroat with Michigan and cutthroat enough for Michigan uh, ever since 2020, uh, ever since he said, I'll hang a hundred on you. And he has not hung a hundred in the past three games combined. So, right. and, and now he's lost, he's lost a coach over it too. Yeah. But I do want to make myself clear. I wish nothing but the worst for Tony Alford in his coaching career. And as reasonable as my takes are, I have irreasonable disgust for his coaching career. Ohio State's going to go crazy this year. <laughs> I hope so. They're going to go crazy regardless. Lord, I need it. Please. <laughs> <laughs> My heart can't take it anymore. Yeah. Uh, Feel that. John, I, John, I appreciate you, man, but I, I, these last three years have sucked. I hate him. <laughs> I feel so bad for you with all those 11 wins, you know, and play <laughs> appearances. Uh, uh, guys have all the luck. Oh. Tears of my eyes. Uh, <laughs> Tears of right. joy, we'll, sadness. We'll take Ryan Day in the rest. Above. All the above. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's move on over to the quarterback. Uh, the quarterback uh, predictions here. Let me bring up my screen. I forgot to share it. I did this last time. <laughs> hey, Surprise! There we go. All right, QB list options. So what I've done here, guys, is I've gone through and I have listed every relevant QB that I can find. Any QB that was talked about in an article about who's going to be starting. So if I have a QB not on here, it's because I did not read anything about them being relevant for the starting job. All right. So, you know, don't tell me your walk on sophomore red shirt quarterback from, you know, you know, zero zone Indiana. Uh, is not on here. Uh, you know, I, I only am listing the relevant ones, and there are probably some that I overlisted just to be safe. But anyway, what we'll do is we'll each give our thoughts on who we think the quarterback is. Whoever we three agree on is who we, we will kind of declare our projected quarterback as. Obviously, I'm going to go with more of what Justin thinks in the uh, in Nebraska battle. Justin will probably go with more of what maybe me and Zach think with the Ohio State battle. But uh, at the end of the day, we will probably all come to some type of agreement at the end. So is that fair, guys? Yep. All right. That's that's fair. All right. Let's start with Illinois. Uh, Donovan Leary is there, the the brother of uh, Devin Leary, who was at Kentucky last year. But Luke Altmeyer was the starter. He did get benched at one point. But uh, the guy, I forget his name, Pad Padlock, Pad Paddock, Paddock. Paddock. Yeah, John Paddock. He uh, Padlock. <laughs> Uh, yeah, whatever. He is gone, so Luke Altmeyer stays. I think Luke Altmeyer comes in as the uh, starter, like last year. Uh, Zach, do you have any objection to that? I got Altmeyer. Yeah, Justin, you say I got Altmeyer as well. You know, he was inconsistent at times last year, but he showed flashes, and he showed flashes of dynamicism. You know, he was a top five player in the state of Mississippi. So, yeah, I think it's Altmeyer. All right, so we're just gonna go like over. Over here, so we'll actually go to Ohio State next. Ohio State, we have Will Howard, Devin Brown, who started the bowl game last year. Will Howard is a transfer coming in from Kansas State that uh, you know some people are saying, which I don't entirely disagree with, that he got benched at Kansas State for the uh, recruit that came in there. So kind of a weird situation. Then Lincoln Key holds the guy who came in for Devin Brown when he got hurt and uh, didn't look great, but looked like a freshman. And then you have your freshman Julian saying. 
and Aaron Nolan who are there as well. Uh, without going too deep into it, I still feel like it's probably Will Howard, but I know Zach has a feeling that it could also be Devin Brown. I know that that is something that some Ohio State uh, you know, podcasts and stuff are saying, and that's gaining more buzz. But um, but we'll see what happens there. I don't think Julian Sane or Aaron Nolan have a chance starting game one. Uh, but Zach, we'll uh, we'll go with your thoughts. It's gonna be Jeremiah Smith and the Wildcat. Let's get no I'm kidding. Nice. Um, <laughs> I I think I, Will Howard. Just the more I have thought about it, I feel like he does not move the needle. And I think they trust, I think they're going to trust him. I just, I think Ryan Day really wants Devin Brown to be the starter. Like, I think he wants to give him every opportunity. I think he's taking first team reps during spring ball. And I, I, I just, there's something about Ryan Day. He handpicked him as a recruit. I think he wanted to play Devin Brown over Kyle McCord, but he was just too inconsistent. And so I, I'll probably get to, to September or August and be like, that's ah, probably Will Howard. But right now I, th I think I'm actually putting my chips on Devin Brown. Wow. So Justin, you actually are the deciding vote here. Uh, I don't know how much Ohio state research you did going into this, but uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going Will Howard. I, 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 I see what Zach says about him not moving the needle. Um, and I, I agree in terms of the big picture, but I do think that there are some nuances to Will Howard's game that, he's going to be able to bring in and, and that's going to help them yeah, right. as opposed to Kyle McCord. There were some, you know, there's nuances their game while they look like very similar quarterbacks. Their stats are very similar. I just didn't think there's certain things in Will Howard's game that, that they wanted that Kyle McCord couldn't give them. And um, I, you know, I think Chip Kelly is going to want somebody who is, you know, has experience. And I, I think that the reason why they probably will go with the experienced guys, because Ohio state doesn't need a huge improvement at quarterback to get much better. They got better everywhere else. So if they can have Will Howard come in and do, you know, what Kyle McCord did, they're still going to be probably the top team in college football, in my opinion. So I don't think they need to risk it with throwing Drew Brown out there. Um, or Devin Brown, I'm sorry, and, and um, Drew Brown's an old Nebraska kicker. Um, <laughs> we don't want him starting. <laughs> no, no. Well, we might, but no. Uh, to, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think for those reasons, I just think uh, Will Howard's going to be the guy. I think it's the safest option. Yeah. Yeah, I, that was the other piece of it that I was going to say was experience as well with this many guys coming back. I feel like at least at the beginning of the year, you have to go with the guy who has experience. You can't go with, uh, you know, non-experienced guy sorry is that good make or break year like if you're on the hot yeah. seat go with the experience right yeah i think i think the thing that devin brown would have to prove is that he's consistent and reliable and mm -hmm. i i so i would agree that if he can't prove that in practice then it's absolutely will howard because he's proven he can that will howard is reliable and consistent um so i, I think that's a fair I, I think either of those those guys, Yankee Yankee Wolverine, who's he's my guy. Uh, even as a Michigan guy, he's my guy. But he, he asked the question: Is QB the weak link to Ohio State in twenty twenty four? I think honestly, yes. And I think that's why we're having the discussion about Will Howard and Devin Brown. Is yep. and like why I think they would go Will Howard is because they want the reliable guy. They don't necessarily have. I, I think the guy is either Julian Sane or Aaron Nolan. Nol yeah, Aaron Nolan. But that's a couple years down down the road yankee says he'd take kyle mccord over all of them <laughs> okay yankee <laughs> i mean honestly don't, if kyle don't say the, those name that name in front of an ohio state fan sorry go ahead, just again with the improvement like kyle mccord this team is probably better even if he's still the quarterback you know yeah, so it I, doesn't I take actually, much i actually might agree yeah he would have more experience and would definitely make him make him better so all right, let's go on to our next one. Indiana, uh, Taven Jackson started off the year, the start of last year, he eventually got benched for, um, I'm forgetting the uh, quarterback's name, but uh, but he is gone, and now it is Curtis Rourke who is brought in, who kind of seems to be the favorite for that position. Justin, do you agree that Curtis Rourke is the guy, or are you going to go with somebody like Taven Jackson? Yeah, I'm going to go with Curtis Rourke, and I um, had notes on Curtis Rourke, but I just accidentally deleted him while I was trying to find him, but <laughs> Um, yes, I, I just think it's one of those things, stability things, and Indiana um, 
Indiana kind of is what they are. Their ceiling is what it is. I don't think this is going to be too much of a painstaking process. I think Curtis Rourke needs to be the guy. Just experience alone, and Indiana is going to need an experienced quarterback just because their talent level isn't there. Yeah, you, you agree, Zach? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think – and Curtis Rourke was great for Ohio. So I, I think it's – I think he'll transition in there, there well. He has a lot of experience. Um, and I think it, it – it gives Kurt Signetti's crew a, a boost, I think, as they as he has his first season. Curtis Rourke, interesting fact, he actually had a top five QBR in 2022 uh, with C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, Caleb Williams. No, was it Caleb Williams or Bryce Young? Uh, and then Bryce. Curtis Rourke and uh, McLeod, the guy from James Madison, who, you know, Kurt, uh, Kurt Signetti was a coach for. So, and that takes yeah. the totality of everything into account, everything quarterback does. Yep. Yep. So, all right. Uh, move on over to Oregon. So they brought in two new quarterbacks this year. Austin Novosad was really the only quarterback of note that stayed. He is the same year as Dante Moore. So we'll see kind of how that position as uh, the secondary quarterback there pans out. However, I think at the end of the day, it probably is Dylan Gabriel. Zach, do you agree? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Heisman. I think he could be a Heisman contender at Oregon. I think his odds are up there. Yeah. Justin. I think they had the two best quarterback additions of the offseason sans Nebraska. Um, uh, Dante Moore is a great quarterback to have, but yeah, it's Dylan Gabriel, but what a great quarterback situation to be in there. Yeah, for real, for real. All right, not I'm trying to get through this. So I'm not doing the chat too much, but Dave does have a question on Indiana. Can Indiana make a bowl game with Curtis Work at QB? I think Curtis Work is bowl game good enough. I question if the rest of the team is. What were you going to say, Justin? I, I would have to take a look at their schedule before I could yeah. determine that. They their first six games would be winnable. <laughs> like They're FIU, Indiana. Indiana. FIU, Indiana. make a well, ball game with Peyton Manning in his prime at their <laughs> yeah. FIU, Western Illinois, no. UCLA, Charlotte, Maryland, Northwestern. Oh yeah, yeah, but they have a shot. Their their last six games though are not not winnable. <laughs> I would say the under is more likely, but they got a yeah. shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on over to Iowa. Uh, Zach made a joke going into this. He said, can we just not pick a quarterback for Iowa? Cause they won't have one. <laughs> I feel like that'd be a little disrespectful. I know Justin just would like threw it. me under the bus, man. We, what the we, heck? <laughs> we would have picked Caden Proctor, but uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, no, I think I, I actually, I actually think Kate McNamara could have a pretty good year this year coming back for what is it? I think it's his fifth year. Uh, so I'm going to go obviously with Kate McNamara. And I actually think that this, uh, Marco, I don't know how to say his last name, lanes, lens, whatever, however you say it. I actually think he could be their backup quarterback instead of Deacon Hill this year. He played pretty good in the bowl game and showed some flashes. And mm -hmm. if you ask me, you need an athletic quarterback back there for when the, for when stuff breaks down, but we'll see with what uh Tim Lester comes up with. But I think it's Cade McNamara. Zach, do you have any opposition to that? No, I think Cade McNamara, especially with an improved offensive philosophy, uh, I think is going to be, I think he'll be pretty good for Iowa this year. Yeah. What do you think, Justin? Yeah. Um, Cade McNamara, Tim Lester's offense, I think, you know, is, I, I think Tim Lester is going to make that offense better. Um, and I think Cade McNamara is, is, you know, he has to be the guy's the air incumbent. He's not going to be, he might be injured for part of spring. Um, and even then he's still going to run away with the job. Deacon Hill's terrible. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Justin, I wasn't laughing at you. I was no, like, you're good. Yankee. Dozens of yards. Just, you're good. <laughs> Cade will throw for dozens of yards. That's fine. Yes, but you make excellent points, Justin, yeah, even though we were um, laughing at Yankees comments. No, that's fine. Right. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh Penn State. So here here's here's the thing. Penn State, Drew Aller will be the starting quarterback. However, Bo Prabula, Prabula, whatever you however you pronounce his last yeah. name. Again, I'm terrible with pronouncing names. He was not terrible going into like the backup situation when he played when Drew Aller went, Aller went down a couple times last year. So like I'm not saying Bo is gonna be the starter or anything like that, but if Drew Aller does have a bad uh you know, season and things don't start out well, which I think Drew Aller is good. So I don't think I'm projecting that to happen. Don't be surprised if Bo comes in and starts getting some, uh, some time. Is that, uh, uh, Justin, you agree Drew Aller is going to be the guy. And do you have any yeah. thoughts on Bo? 
Yeah, it, Drew Aller is going to be the guy, and it, the only reason um, he would get benched is because Penn State has been supposed to take this leap for so long, and this is the year, again, people are saying, like, okay, they expect Drew Aller to be the reason that Penn State takes that jump because they expect his year-over-year -year jump to be that. And, you know, I could see an emotional reaction if he doesn't pan out to where they do make that move. You know, the fan base pressure might might push that on him, but yeah. So, But it's Drew Aller. Exactly. Yeah, I think I like I think that the one reason why Prabula would get more time is I think is most likely like a wildcat package or some sort of package of plays. I I'm curious to see how the new offensive coordinator helps Drew Drew Alar cuz I I don't think James Franklin has traditionally done well with traditional dropback passers. Like he's done really well I, I don't think he did a great job with uh, the first quarterback that he had uh, that was Bill O'Brien recruit or had him Christian Hackenberg. Oh yeah. Um, did terrible with him, but McSorley and Sean Clifford, I thought were both really good. They were mobile could run read option. I, I don't think he knows how to, how to deal with drop back passers in his offense. And so I think it's going to really help to have uh Kotal Nicky as his offensive coordinator. But I, I would not be surprised to see an uptick in Prabula's playing time just with particular packages as a as a run threat. Yeah, no, I agree. All right. Uh this is one of the ones I actually I didn't even write a name down for because I am just so perplexed by this and there are so many and so little people are writing about this. Uh but the Maryland Terrapins, their quarterback situation this offseason, I will admit anybody that I pick here, I don't write my name in stone with it. It's like I'm kind of just taking a shot in the dark here. MJ Morris comes in as a transfer. Billy Edwards Jr. started that bowl game, did did pretty well for them. Uh Cameron Edge, Jaden Saray and Champ Long uh, are all options that have been written about as well. I mean, to me, it's kind of between Morris and Billy Edwards Jr., but honestly, I could go either way on this one. And if Justin comes in here and says, actually, Cameron Edge is doing very well so far, and he could be the starter. Like, I'm not going to argue with him because yeah. at the end of the day, like I said, I, I like there just doesn't seem to be a front runner here at all, and it sounds like this could honestly be anybody's job to win. Uh, so I'll reserve my pick for last, but Justin, why don't you go first? Um, I think it's going to be MJ Morris, and I had MJ Morris a lot higher up. And when when talk about little transfer little rankings, little yeah. at Maryland, yeah, I had him higher on my transfer rankings because I I kind of like what MJ Morris can do. I just I do think he needs, you know, of course, development with his accuracy. He doesn't really have the velocity to throw the deep ball, so it depends on what style of offense Maryland wants to run if they want to utilize the deep ball. But he has the legs, you know, he can move. He's good with rhythm throws and stuff like that. So if you can get him in, in, in a rhythm and just get him on some some you know quick routes and even the intermediate game, but he's just not going to be able to really give you the consistent deep ball accuracy that you want. But I think he does a lot of things well, and I think he is the type of quarterback that can come in and somewhat run a similar offense to Tagovailoa, albeit probably a little less uh, efficient and but um, you know, we'll see. Uh, Mike Loxley, we'll see what 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 happens there. But I, I think MJ Morris, the guy, I like MJ Morris. I, I I'm higher on him than most people. I just think potential, and and I I'm a big film guy. You know, I try to watch a lot of film and stuff like that. And I, I like MJ Morris as a quarterback. So I'm I'm excited to see the dynamicism if he does end up winning the job. Oh, and you think if he comes in, he you know he, he has to feel like he has a pretty good chance of winning that job as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Zach, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it it's hard because I I I've mostly seen Billy Edwards as a run threat. Like I think he I don't know if he's done great with his arm, and I haven't watched a ton of film on on Edwards. Mm -hmm. Um, the the guy who might be able to out throw Morris is Edge. You know, mm -hmm. he had a pretty decent bowl game against Auburn, but I I I think I agree with you, Justin. I I don't. I think MJ Morris has the edge. He played pretty well for NC State. And I, I, I think he's better than both the other options. Yeah. Well, you guys have convinced me. I'll go with MJ Morris too. <laughs> Not like it matters. His so. stats will jump off the page, but like what what I saw, what I see in him, I, I think the potential is there if they can just develop him right. Yeah, I will honestly say I did not watch much NC State football last year. Uh, yeah, so. 
<laughs> it wasn't wasn't my uh, first first look when I was watching. Uh, all right, guys. Purdue Hudson card redshirt sophomore. Uh, there is another or redshirt senior. There are, is another redshirt senior on this uh, roster. However, I don't really think he has a chance to uh, supplant Hudson card. So, I mean, we. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts, but we all agree Hudson card, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Sorry, Purdue fans. I don't really think there's much mystery there to talk about. So no. uh, Michigan State, kind of the same way. Aiden Childs comes in and he was the you know heir apparent uh, at, at uh, Oregon State, was with Jonathan Smith, and Jonathan Smith brought him in, brought in basically this entire quarterback room. And so uh, I think they're all brand new. There is a redshirt senior in there, but I don't I don't think he has a chance to start over Aiden Childs. So yeah. uh, unless you guys have any different opinions there. No, um, they yeah they lost their starter and their backup. So I think they lost all Tim three. Levitt. <laughs> Tim Levitt, yeah, they might have. Yeah, Noah Kim, uh, Kent. No, not Kent. Anyway, uh, yeah, they lost I like Tim Levitt though. I liked him a lot. Yeah, Sam Levitt. That's one. All right, uh, Rutgers. So this yeah. one's actually pretty interesting as well. We have a few interesting ones here, uh, back to back to back. We'll get to Michigan next, but uh, Rutgers. We have Gavin Wimsat and Athen Kaliak Manis. Those kind of seem to be the two front runners. I've seen Shepard and O'Sullivan mentioned as well, but obviously not on the same level as Wimsat and Kaliak Manis. So uh, Zach, you have any thoughts here on Wimsat versus Kaliak Manis? I. I know a lot of Rutgers fans get frustrated with Wimsat's accuracy. I just think his athleticism is tantalizing. And I think, I think Wimsat's improved every year. And I, I don't, this is just my personal thought. I don't see anything with Kaliak Manis that makes me go, oh yeah, he should definitely start over Wimsat, especially because Wimsat knows the playbook. So I, I would, I would, tend to pick whims at that's that would be my pick justin um yeah so um athan kaliak manis is terrible <laughs> okay he is trash <laughs> gavin Wimsett is gonna win this job um yeah he like i get that you know athan kaliak manis has a little bit of a better percentage but it's negligible um as far as completion percentage gavin Wimsett, you know um Four star recruit, six uh, six starts in twenty twenty two. You know, about a fifty percent completion percentage, nine touchdowns, eight interceptions. But like like Zach said, he has the running ability. He was the second leading rusher, and you know he looks to be improving in terms of his passing ability. And you know that there are other issues there at Rutgers on the offense, the offensive line, the wide receivers aren't nothing to write home about. So um, I do think Gavin Wimsett is going to. Uh, win this job based on the fact that Ethan Kaliak Manis couldn't probably start for ITT Technical Institute right now. So it was interesting before we got on here. I was actually listening to a, a video of a Rutgers um, guy talking about how he thinks Ethan Kaliak Manis is going to be the starter. This I could year. be wrong, but I can't stand the guy. Man. Uh, well, and He's like terrible. the reasonings, and, and I and I understood what you're saying. The reasonings was that he believes Athen Kaliak Manis offers more potential because of his body size and because he has a stronger arm that can throw better, and he has underrated athleticism. Um, I don't. Too- <laughs> I, I see the size. Like I see that he has, you know, an NFL body. But my problem is like. You can have an NFL body, but if you don't have NFL ability, it doesn't really do much for you. So at the end of the night, like I, I could see Athen Kaliak Manis maybe getting it just because of Kirk Soraka and like that previous, you yeah. know, relationship there. And it's also possible Athen Kaliak Manis just said, look, if I'm not going to be an NFL quarterback, I might as well go finish out with my old OC that I liked better anyway. And uh, yeah. Minnesota fans don't really like me anyway, which, you know, everything I read on Twitter, I don't think they really liked them all that much. So I get it. But um, so I, I tend to agree it's going to be Wimsat, but based on some stuff that I've heard and read, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if it turns into Kaliak Manis. There are so many nuances that are beyond size. Like that's like the surface level. Like I'm going to go look at this player's bio and I'm going to see his size and his arm strength. And then we're going to judge him off of that. There's so much more than that. If you well, watch it's- Kaliak Manis play, he gave uh, uh, PJ Fleck his second worst season in his tenure there, seven years. Okay. He is garbage. 
Oh, it's like the same stuff I get on at the NFL for, for uh, what's that Tennessee old Michigan quarterback's name? Um, uh, he was just there last year. Super big arm. People are crazy. Oh, about Joe him. Milton. Joe Milton. Joe Milton. Yeah. It's like the same thing where it's like, guys, yes, he has a big arm. Yes, he can throw it 80 yards, but the dude sucks. Like, <laughs> he's not good. So, you know, you can draft him and think you can fix him. But uh, so for Rutgers sake, I do think it's I, I do hope it's Wimsat because I do think he'll be better. So, yep. all right, guys, let's move on to uh, to Michigan. We got John Diadmo here in the chat. So I'm sure John will uh, share his thoughts as well. But uh, honestly, like based off the stuff that I've read, I could see any one of these five being the starter. Uh, everybody kind of seems to be split on it. I know there's some people. Uh, on Twitter that are saying Alex Orgy is a, is a Heisman contender. So, you know, if he, obviously if that happens, he's a starting quarterback, but uh, you know, I, I just haven't seen any of these guys really play. Jack Tuttle did well in uh, as a reserve for uh, JJ McCarthy last year. I guess he wasn't really as a reserve. He kind of came in with a second team came in. So, uh, but he, he did well. I liked, I liked what I saw from his uh, arm ability and overall, but at the end of the day, I think Alex Orgy has some of the more hype a uh, hype um, and Jaden da Davis has some hype too, but at the end of the day, I couldn't, you know, I, I tend to lean one way with one of them, but if it was somebody else, I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Justin, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, you know, I like Alex Orgy and Jaden Davis. Um, I, you know, Jack Tuttle got approved for his seventh year, I believe, but I, I think it's Alex Orgy. I think I like him right now as the better combination of, of, um, skill and you know just you know Jaden Davis being a freshman I think he will he's the air incumbent but I don't think he's quite there yet um I wouldn't be surprised but I think it's going to be Alex Orgy I, I'm I'm higher than out on Alex Orgy the most um I like him but yeah I'm not as intertwined as Michigan is so John DiAdamo can correct me if I'm wrong but I like Alex Orgy and, I, and, and for the record, I like Alex Orchie too. If I'm picking one, I'm picking Alex Orchie as well because yeah. I do think that he offers running ability that is going to be good for a first-time head coach and a first-time – well, I guess not. For, it's not his first time. He was at Old Dominion. But uh, somebody – their first time in a power conference as a offensive coordinator – in Kurt Campbell. So uh, I think that offers a lot of, uh, you know, different options that you can do on the ground as well. So I'm going to go with Alex Orgy as well. Zach, do you have a different thought? I, so I'm cheating a little bit. I'm, I'm looking at two, four, seven. Uh, I've looked at a few different sites and prep for this. I, I'm going to go with a dark horse here in Jaden Denigal. Um, oh. uh, there's just a lot of hype. There's been some hype around him. Uh, he ranked as a top 20. Uh, quarterback coming out of 2022. I think Orgy, there's just, it's, it's a, been a lot of run threat and Jaden Davis is a true freshman. So I, I don't know. I, I could very easily be wrong here and I could be just going off the hype of a, of a well-respected uh, news site, sports news site. But I don't know. I, I just, I wonder if it's the guy that we're not suspecting that could be the guy that comes in and wins this race. Yep. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, I could see any five of them. Like, if even if Davis Warren comes out and he's a starter, like I would, yeah. I would be surprised. But I would be like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I didn't think it was an option in the off season. Yeah, Dave, Dave is apparently on uh, Team Orgy, just a different one, <laughs> spelled with an O R J Y J I and an A. He said everyone likes N, so it's just the wrong kind, yeah. wrong, wrong channel. <laughs> Jeez. All right, quickly, let's move on to USC. Or I get us banned and demonetized. Yeah, I know, right? I, they do ask those questions now that I have a thousand subscribers. They're like, did you mention any? Oh, I know. They content? do it on the Husker channel, but like that, there you have to say like cuss words and something really bad. Not that. Yeah. All right. Uh, USC, Miller Moss, Jaden Maeva. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Jake Jensen, Miller Moss started the bowl game. Every USC fan se seems to think that uh, he is the guy. I don't tend to argue with him. I think he is as well. Zach, do you have a different opinion? Uh, he, I mean, he destroyed Louisville. He, he's the guy. Yeah. Justin? Miller Moss. Yeah, he's, he's a pocket QB. He does everything well in terms of being a pocket quarterback. He doesn't lose composure. That's, the, you know, he is... He is one of those guys that is very, um, 
don't know, methodical in, in the way he operates. And I've learned a lot about Miller Moss just from talking with, uh, on a USC program overview and stuff like that too. So, um, yeah, l losing a little bit of using a little bit of insight that I got from them over there. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it's the, uh, the choice. So, all right. Uh, Minnesota, Max Brosmer coming in from the portal. They have a completely new, uh, quarterback room. I don't see any reason. Max Brosmer is very good at what was it, New Hampshire? I think uh, yeah. he was very good there. So I don't see any reason why they would pick uh, Chicken Jansky name. I cannot pronounce sure. <laughs> the other Max. Uh, we don't need but, to know it this year, anyways. Yeah, uh, Justin, do you uh, you think it's gonna be Brosmer too? Yeah, he was first in the FCS in passing yards per game, total offense per game. He had like 60 touchdowns in two seasons or something like that. Yeah, he's he's the guy. Zach? Yep. yep. Agreed. All right. Uh, a little bit more difficult one here. Ethan Garbers, Colin Shee, Justin Martin, Henry Hasselback, and Carson Gordon for UCLA. I, right before we came on here, I read an article saying that from 24 seven. So it's not like this is just some schmo U UCLA site, but uh, saying that they would not be surprised if Henry Hasselbeck or Carson Gordon are the starter because they're looking at this year as basically it's going to be terrible anyway. So why don't we just give our future quarterbacks some time? Um, I feel like you're kind of doing Colin Schley and Ethan Garbers a little wrong there personally, but uh, I guess can't, say it wouldn't happen uh zach do you have any thoughts on who the starter is here i think it's garbers i think he's the guy um you know he started last year um yeah i mean i, I think that's the way to go um i i get the possibility of a freshman but you have a red shirt senior who has starts under his belt and who played fairly well for ucla last year so i don't see why you'd switch from that yeah, I think it's Garbers too. He played uh played well in the bowl game, and I just I feel like for Deshaun Foster, that's kind of the the easy choice. But uh, Justin, you have any different thoughts? Yeah, Garbers. Um, you know, eleven touchdowns, three interceptions. He was a four star kid. Uh, the only reason I think they would pick somebody else is because their quarterback or their head coach, um, who they got as our head coach, was completely wrong decision. And if he makes a mistake, he'll start one of them. That could be true. Yeah. All right. Uh, I like how Nebraska has like the least experienced quarterback room, but you gave them the longest list. Well, that was because all of them were mentioned. When I <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Literally, we're going to need all hands on deck potentially. Uh, Yankee says, great pod, as always. And I'll even say it for you, Yankee. Go blue. So there you go. I, uh, I'll even say it for you. So, you type it. I'll say it. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'll have to fair watch end of the that's, that's a dangerous <laughs> thing to I've say, done, JR. I've yeah. done it on my mind too. Yeah, all right. Uh, Nebraska, Henry Harburg, I think, and Dylan Rayola Henry. are really the only two options, or Henry no, Heinrich Harburg <laughs> and uh, Dylan Rayola are really the only two options here. But I have seen these other guys mentioned as well. Justin, uh, who are you going with here? Yeah, uh, so for me, it's uh, really Dan Danny Kalen, Dylan Raiola. Like Daniel Kalen is was the guy that basically committed when Raiola went to Georgia, and he stuck with his commitment. So he is a four star kid, true freshman as well. And so you know, Harburg has a lot of flaws and stuff he needs to work on. I don't. I think Harburg. I don't think Harburg will be the starter. I think it's Raiola's job. You know, no matter what, I think it's Raiola's job. But I do think Kalen is probably going to push him the most as far as talent. But Raiola is going to get the job, no doubt about it in my mind. You know, R Rule's already talking. He's attacking it. Um, he's there at 6 a.m. You know, 10 a.m. is his workout. And he's there at 6 a.m. working by himself. The rest of these guys, Luke Longval, um, suck up Jack Woch, uh, Woch, Wochi. Sorry, I was having a stroke there. Uh, those are walk-ons. So, you know, based on the scholarship guys, it's Harburg. Danny Kalen and Dylan Ryle and Dylan Ryle is going to get the job no matter what. Yeah. Zach, your thoughts? Yeah, Justin, you you convinced me ever since you came on to the show, onto our show here, um, that it's going to be Rayola. And I haven't I haven't changed my mind on that. Yep. All right. Rayola it is. All right. I think the rest of these three are pretty self-explanatory, but we'll talk about them just to be sure. Uh Washington, Will Rogers. Zach, you have any disagreement with that? He he got out of the transfer portal and came back to Washington, and I think it's because he knows he's going to have the job. Yeah, agreed. Justin, agreed. 100%. All right, 
Will Rogers, Northwestern. I think Brendan Sullivan is most likely the guy. Ryan Helsinki, I think he was the one that came in during that bowl game. So uh, I guess he could possibly push for it, but I think Sullivan is most likely the guy in this situation. Justin, you have any opposition to that? I like Ryan Helsinki. Do you? But, okay. But but I, I think uh yeah, I, I think Brennan Sullivan might be the guy, but I dude, I'm not I'm not I don't think Ryan Helisky's out of it, but I don't think he's out of it either. I just think right now the 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 kind of group the, think and what most people think is gonna happen is in that direction. Sullivan. Yeah. Yeah. And That's Sullivan it. Sullivan played well in relief of Ben Bryant last year. Mm-hmm. Um it's weird because Ryan Helinski was a starter for South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And like played well. And I thought when Northwestern got him, I'm like, oh, he is the heir apparent and he has not been, which is, has very, it surprised me because I thought he played well at South Carolina. So but yeah, Sullivan. I like him. Yeah. All right. Go with Sullivan. Last one. Wisconsin has brought in another transfer quarterback. Braden Locke did start last year when, uh, what's his name? Uh, okay. Can't remember his name, but, uh, the, uh, Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai, Mordecai. Yeah. Yeah. Now Tanner Morgan is a is a Minnesota quarterback. Yeah, too many names. I just get all the Big Ten quarterbacks mixed up. There's so many. Uh, but Nick Evers is also he he was a highly rated recruit uh, who came in as well. So he also could be vying for that second uh, position there. But I still think it's going to be Tyler Van Dyke. Zach, you have any opposition to that? Uh, I think I think he might be the best quarterback Wisconsin's had in a long time. Uh, Tyler Van Dyke it is and I just think um, you know it'll be interesting to see how um, um, Luke Fickle's you know offensive system looks this year since there was growing pains last year with uh, uh, Van Dyke and so we'll see I'm I'm curious I'm really curious to see how long it takes him to fully implement that system the way he wants to so Mm -hmm. yeah all right so just to recap our starters are wisconsin tyler van dyke northwestern brendan sullivan washington will rogers nebraska dylan rayola ucla ethan garbers minnesota max brosmer michigan alex orgy usc miller moss Rutgers, gavin wimsat michigan state aiden giles purdue hudson card Maryland, MJ Morris, Penn State, Drew Aller, Iowa, Cade McNamara, Indiana, Curtis Rourke, Oregon, Dylan Gabriel, Ohio State, Will Howard, Illinois, Luke Altmeyer. If uh, you're watching this after the fact and you have any opposition to those, please do let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Obviously, some of these are easier to pick than others. However, if uh, you feel a certain way, we'd love to get your take on it. So, all right, guys, that's uh that's what we go got for the show tonight. Appreciate you guys being here. Justin, why don't you tell uh, people where they can find you at? Yeah, so you can find me over at Nebraska Football at the Voice of College Football over on the Mark Rogers Network. So um, if you're a Nebraska fan or want some intel on Nebraska, follow us over there. Um, I'm content creator over there. And then uh, at, at the Big Ten Show or at Big Ten Show on YouTube, um, you know, we're doing program overviews of all 18 teams. We've done half of the league. We have coaches' power rankings coming out and uh, a couple other things coming out for y'all and, and the rest of the program overview. So at Big Ten Show. Very good. Zach, where can people find you? Well, they can find me every Tuesday night at 9 o'clock here on the Big Ten Huddle. Of course. So, And uh, I, I do post uh, sporadically now on the Big Ten Football Talk podcast. Um, but that has, in a sense, taken a back burner. But I'll try to, I'm going to try to get a few more episodes out in the near future. It's just life has been crazy. But you can you can really catch me here uh, on Tuesdays at nine and uh, probably at during football season twice a week here on the Big Ten Huddle. So, yep, we'll uh, we'll schedule things differently when football season comes around. But at least for now, in the off season, Tuesdays at nine seem to be uh, the time that works best for us. So we'll be here for it. So thank you everybody for listening and tuning in. We appreciate you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Jack. Jack. Thank you, Zach. My son's name is Jack. So uh, thank you, Zach, for being here. Have a good night, everybody.